Hello, everyone, and welcome to the lecture on Vladimir Mayakovsky, one of the most interesting, exciting, and tragic poets of the 20th century. Mayakovsky holds a special place in my heart because the first poetry I read in Russian was a collection of Mayakovsky's that I got while I was doing a study abroad in Moscow. I picked it up and tried to read it, didn't really understand it, but I understood the foreword pretty well and uh, instantly developed a strong love for Mayakovsky. I later went on to read the whole thing several times, uh, memorized several of the poems by heart, some of which we're going to read for this section, and seriously considered writing my dissertation about Mayakovsky. I did not do so, but I told a good friend of mine in grad school about Mayakovsky. He started reading him, and he wrote his dissertation in part about Mayakovsky. So you see how these things go around. Uh, I hope that you are able to enjoy Mayakovsky as much as I have. Like most of the authors we have surveyed in this class, Mayakovsky was of Russian noble descent. However, his life was a little bit different than that of many of the authors we've seen. Uh, although his father was of noble descent, he was a worker. He worked as a forestry worker and he worked in Georgia. Georgia the country, that is, not Georgia the state. Mayakovsky's mother was Ukrainian, so he grew up in a Russian-Ukrainian household, but in Georgia, and he grew up speaking both Russian and Georgian. And he said that Georgian and Georgia continued to have a big influence on him throughout his life. His father died of blood poisoning when he was 13, and after this, the family moved from Georgia to Moscow, where they lived in comparative poverty. While in school in Moscow as a teenager, Mayakovsky became heavily involved in the communist cause. He joined the Communist Party and worked um, as an activist, including doing things like helping break uh, female prisoners out of jail. And this led to an 11-month-long jail sentence uh, from 1909 to 1910. And he was kept in solitary confinement in Butyrka prison in Moscow. While he was in prison, he began writing poetry. Uh, his poetry was confiscated when he was let out. Uh, so all of that was lost, which he said was good because he said it was not very good poetry. Uh, most early poetry is not very good poetry. Uh, but he gained uh, the taste and the ability to write poetry while he was in prison. And he decided after that that he was going to focus on poetry and art rather than politics. He realized that he had more talent and interest for art than for political activism, although he remained committed to the communist cause for the rest of his life. After he got out of prison, he was befriended by David Burluk, whom you will remember as an impresario who uh, was a major founder of the Futurist movement. And David Burluk uh, encouraged him to write and perform and brought him into the Cubo Futurist group, also known as Hylia. And Mayakovsky began writing and performing with Hylia, or the Cubo Futurists, uh, and they would stage outdoor or public performances uh, that often involved costumes. Mayakovsky didn't have money for costumes or for a nice suit, and so he made kind of a suit slash costume out of his sister's clothes. And you can see a picture there of him on the left uh, from 1910, uh, dressed up in this kind of costume he made out of his sister's clothes. He took uh, some yellow silk from his sister's dress and a uh, bright ribbon and made himself this costume. And so when you read Kofta Fata, uh, that is what that's about, in part, is the fact that he was performing in this very bright, garish outfit made out of his sister's clothes. He quickly started generating attention uh, and started traveling around the country. In 1912, he went to St. Petersburg and performed at the Stray Dog Cafe. Uh, if you remember, this is where the Acmeists hung out, but they had public readings for all kinds of poets, uh, including future futurists like Mayakovsky, and so Mayakovsky performed at the Stray Dog Cafe. And that same year, he also co-signed and was first published in A Slap in the Face of Public Taste 
1913, he published his first individual poetry collection, which was called Ya, or I, and he traveled around the country on a touring futurist exhibition uh, where he performed his dramatic monologue, Vladimir Mayakovsky. So as you can already tell, uh, his poetry was very um, egocentric is maybe the wrong word, but it was very focused on him and all about him. And that was part of the idea that these futurists were trying to be very shocking and do things that were socially unacceptable. And one of the things that he did is that this comparatively unknown poet wrote and performed these poems and this monologue that was all about him and his suffering and his life. And these performances, um, which involve dressing up wildly, uh, there we see a picture of Mayakovsky in 1914, now wearing a top hat and carrying a cane, um, but looking very, very stylized, that they presented this very stylized persona. Uh, and so these performances in which they would dress up uh, often in kind of extravagant or strange ways and perform uh, rather shocking or um, deliberately uh, disconcerting works caused a scandal. Uh, they were frequently shut down by the police. Uh, both Mayakovsky and Burluk, who were in art school together, uh, were expelled as a result of these performances. So Mayakovsky, like several of the poets we've encountered in the 20th century, did go to college but never actually finished his degree. He instead ended up getting kicked out. Uh, if you remember, Mandelstam never finished either. Uh, this is pretty common. Yesenin never finished. Uh, this is pretty common. They ended up uh, quitting or getting kicked out and just focusing on their poetry. In 1915, Mayakovsky had what would be a fateful meeting. He met a young woman named Lilia Brik and instantly fell madly in love with her and wrote a very long poem called Oblaka of Stanach, which is normally translated as a cloud in trousers or sometimes a cloud in pants that he dedicated to her. And this poem brought him considerable attention and cemented him as a rising star of the period. At the same time, he and Lilia Brik uh, were in a relationship. Uh, this was complicated by the fact that Lilia or Lili was married, and her husband, however, did not seem to mind the relationship. In fact, he seemed to give it his blessing, and all three of them ended up living together uh, for several years. And Osip Brik, Lilia's husband, um, dedicated himself in part to uh, promoting Mayakovsky's career. So Lilia was kind of his muse and Osip uh, was basically his manager. And they both helped him rise to prominence and become the, po the famous poet that he became. As I mentioned, Mayakovsky kind of turned away from politics after his arrest and focused mainly on his art. Uh, but he continued to be an ardent communist and embraced the revolution enthusiastically. Uh, he wrote a number of pro-Bolshevik poems, uh, one of which we will read here. And he worked for several years for Vrosta, which was the propaganda department, designing posters. So if you've seen the early Soviet propaganda posters, you've almost certainly seen some of Mayakovsky's posters. He was a good visual artist as well as a poet. And so he did the graphic design or did the painting for the posters and also wrote the slogans. He also uh, inadvertently, th this was not supposed to be a slogan, but it became a slogan. Uh, he created the famous slogan, Lenin Gil, Lenin Gif, Lenin Budit Jits, which you've probably heard. Um, he wrote that in his poem, Komsomolskaya, which was written in response to Lenin's death in 1924. And you may not know the rest of the poem, probably most people no longer know the rest of the poem, but most Russian speakers will know this Lenin Zhil, Lenin Zhif, Lenin Budit Zhits. And he continued to perform his poetry. He was really kind of a performance artist as much as a writer. And he gave readings to large gatherings of workers and soldiers. Uh, this became a thing, this became a feature in Soviet life of poets giving readings to very large crowds. 
and Mayakovsky was one of the first to do so. Uh, he very much supported workers and soldiers writing poetry and appreciating poetry, was involved in some writers groups, uh, trying to get workers to write poetry, and also, like I said, interacted with workers and soldiers and uh, the proletariat, basically, and gave them readings and encouraged them to write. He was also a big proponent of cinema, which was a very exciting um, technological advancement at the time, and uh, was in several silent films. There's a link on the slide that shows a YouTube compilation of some of his cinematic recordings, um, and it's joined with um, a recording of him reciting his poetry. He had a very distinctive recitation style. He had a very loud, commanding, deep voice and a very distinctive recitation style. And you can hear him reciting some of his poetry and see some shots of him in some of the silent films that he was in. Unfortunately, even for Mayakovsky, who loved the revolution so much, the Soviet regime was not a very friendly place. Uh, he became increasingly dissatisfied with what he saw as corruption and hypocrisy, uh, clashed repeatedly with Soviet authorities as they tried to clamp down more and more on artistic expression. Uh, if you remember from the lecture on the history of the period, the early years, the early 1920s, were a comparatively free time that allowed lots of not so much political freedom, but a lot of artistic freedom and artistic experimentation. Uh, and that became less and less the case over the course of the 1920s, especially after Lenin's death in 1924 and Stalin's rise to power in 1928. So Mayakovsky continued to declare his um, commitment to the Soviet regime and appear as kind of the public face of the Soviet regime all over the world. Uh, in the 1920s, he traveled all over Europe and North America. Uh, but at the same time, he uh, started writing more and more satirical pieces about it and criticizing it more and more heavily. He also had a lot of problems in his personal life. Uh, he continued to be devoted to Lilia Brik, but that was a difficult relationship, to say the least. Uh, as I mentioned, he lived for several years together with her and her husband in the same apartment. And there's a lot of speculation about exactly what that relationship was like. Sort of a generally accepted uh, narrative about it is that Osip, Lilia's husband, didn't really want to uh, deal with the kind of sexual side of the relationship. Uh, he was older and had health problems, and he just kind of turned Lilia over to Mayakovsky in that manner with his blessing. Uh, Lilia herself once told a rather different story and said, for example, that she enjoyed making love to her husband Osip while keeping Mayakovsky locked in the kitchen. And he would shout and scream and claw at the door and try to get out. And she would just keep him locked away like that. That sounds uh, fairly scandalous, possibly not true or very possibly true. Uh, they had a rather, like I said, difficult and complex relationship. Uh, and he, for example, called himself her dog and signed all his letters to her with a picture of a dog's paw. This did not prevent him from having lots of relationships with other women. Uh, while he was in America, he hooked up with a Russian American uh, with whom he had a daughter. While I was living in New York, she was still alive. I'm not sure if she still is. He also... Uh, fell in love with the Russian-French model Tatiana Yakovleva, uh, and will read a poem that he wrote about her. Uh, that relationship also ended badly. He wanted her to come back to Russia with him, and she refused to do so. And so he had a series of difficult and unhappy relationships in the latter part of his life, um, was becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the Soviet regime, seemed to increasingly feel the strain of writing propaganda for it. And over the course of 1929 and 1930, he wrote a long poem called Vavies Golas, or At the Top of My Voice, uh, 
which was basically a blistering condemnation of kind of himself and the Soviet state and included the very tragic lines, I pacified myself by putting my heel to the throat of my own song, as it's often translated. And with all this, it's perhaps unsurprising that he ended up committing suicide on April 14th, 1930. Uh, this is unsurprising, both because his life was becoming increasingly difficult at the time, and because he had had a fixation on suicide for most of his poetic career. It appears over and over again in his poetry. Uh, he specifically talks about shooting himself in the heart, which is what he ended up actually doing. And according to Lilia Brick, this was like a chronic condition for him that would flare up whenever he was having trouble and he would become suicidal. And finally, in 1930, he went through with it and committed suicide. Uh, this was greeted with um, a tremendous amount of shock and sorrow by the poetic community. At the same time, many poets felt that he had in some ways saved himself uh, by committing suicide in 1930, he was spared uh, becoming Stalin's mouthpiece and was able to sort of go out, uh, go out fairly cleanly and avoid becoming any more entangled with the Soviet regime as it became more and more repressive and less and less friendly to poets and artists and people in general. So what was Mayakovsky's legacy? Uh, if you've been to Moscow, you may have seen the big statue of him there on Mayakovsky Square, uh, which you can see the picture of. As an interesting side note, in the 60s, uh, shortly after the statue was erected, it became a gathering place for poetry readings and political dissent. You've probably also, if you've been in Moscow, uh, traveled through Mayakovsky Station. If you've been to Georgia, you may have seen the town of Mayakovsky, uh, which was what the town where he was born was renamed in his honor. So he became, like I said, kind of the poet of the revolution and the literary face of the Soviet Union. Uh, that almost didn't happen. After his death, his poetry was basically repressed for several years. But in 1935, Lilia Brik wrote to Stalin uh, requesting that they be allowed to publish his poetry again. And Stalin responded personally and issued a communique saying, we must allow this brilliant poet to be published. Uh, and with Stalin's approval, all of a sudden he was completely rehabilitated and was published everywhere. Statues were put up to him. Places were named after him. Um, people were forced to read him. And so he became very influential, but also as the face of the Soviet Union, as the literary face of the Soviet Union, uh, this was a pretty suspect role to hold. And he was presented in this very... Um, one-sided and somewhat disingenuous manner. Um, a lot of the interesting and complex things about his poetry were just kind of brushed under the rug and um, people disliked him as the, you know, official face of Soviet literature and he was considered to be not worth reading because of that. However, uh, later generations rediscovered his poetic genius, for want of a better word, and how he in many ways revolutionized poetry and was incredibly daring and experimental and created this whole new style of poetry. So what did he do to create this new style of poetry? Well, uh, his poetry was mainly non-metric. He claimed that he didn't know iams and trochees and things like that. That's not really true. Uh, he did, and he did occasionally write in them. That being said, as you read his poetry, you'll see that it does not follow the rules for syllabotonic poetry that we've learned. He threw a syllabotonic meter off the steamship of modernity. He was extremely experimental with rhyme and did really interesting things with rhyme. So if you look at his poems, 
you'll be like, hey, it doesn't rhyme. Oh, oops, wait, it does rhyme, but it's not the kind of rhyme that I was expecting. Uh, he did a lot of sound play. Uh, if you remember in the lecture about futurism, the Budetlyanya, the Russian futurists, uh, did a lot of experimentation with sound play and with making up words. And he didn't make up words, uh, but he did do a lot of play with sound. So he basically took the experiments and the innovations of the other futurists and used them in ways that were much more accessible. So his poetry has that daring and that experimentation that the futurists poetry was marked with, but it's much more accessible than most other futurist poetry. Uh, he also created new ways of presenting poetry on the page. Uh, he was interested in the graphic layout of poetry on the page. And so he started off writing in regular strophes or stanzas, uh, but then he switched to the stulbik or column style, uh, and then moved on to the liasinka style in which he split lines up and did these sort of half steps with the lines. And you'll see that when you read the last poem in the handout. And that became very influential and lots of people use that Lysenka style. And so in short, it's hard to imagine Russian poetry without Mayakovsky. Um, he was not the only poet of the 20th century, but he quite literally stood astride over Russian poetry of the 20th century like a colossus, just like his uh, statue does there. And we cannot understand Russian poetry of the 20th century without having a deep appreciation for Mayakovsky.